So welcome everyone to Present Insights 21. This is a co-organized event by Instituto Miguel Galvão Teales and APAC Portugal. Two previous notes about the session. This session will be in English, but there are translations being carried out. So you can access to them by pressing the button you may find in the, on the bottom right side of your screen. And you can also leave your questions. We will have a moment for Q&A before the end of the session. So we encourage you to write down your questions in the QA box by clicking on the, the bottom center of your screen. And you can do it at any time of the session. So feel free to do it from now on. So this is the second session of Present Insights 21 and we'll be addressing the question, how can space trigger reintegration? My name is João H. Pereira. I graduated in architecture in 2008 and I work as an, as an architect ever since. In the last few years, I've been also dedicated to social issues, engaging with several social projects and more recently also working in the field of social impact evaluation. In this session, I will be talking with Matt Dwyer. Welcome, Matt. I'm very pleased to have this conversation with you. Thank you. I will just uh, briefly introduce you. By the way, Matt is in Australia, in Melbourne, I believe. So this is good evening to you, right? Yes, thank you. Yes, good evening. Uh, we're in quiet. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, yes, we're, we're, yes, we're in noon right now. So we're finishing this, our, our morning. So yeah, we're in quite different time zones. So Matt is an architectural graduate too, but also a design researcher focused on the relationship between the design of human environments and its social and ecological implications. He is co-creator of the Local Time Project, which proposes a new architectural model for small scale local facilities for youth justice in the state of Victoria, Australia. And they propose this model as an alternative to high security detention. So in this project, they developed a design guide containing evidence-based guidelines and recommendations for justice authorities regarding this, uh, the design of these facilities. So thank you for being here, Matt. I'm sure we can learn a lot from your experience and your research. That's I. It's a pleasure for me too, thank you. So I believe we all accept the fact that space design won't be able to determine the success of an integration process since it's a very much wide, wider and complex phenomena. We may believe though that um, space can have great impact on people's experience and in the way that a detention facility embodies the ideas of the justice system, the, the justice system regarding uh, this integration process. So this is what we intend to focus on this session, trying to better understand these relations and how can they be addressed. So Matt, I would like to start with local time project. And I would ask you to give us a brief overview of about the main concerns of the project and how did you get to them? Uh, sure. Um, I'll <clears throat> begin by saying that I'm on uh, the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people, um, who are the traditional owners of the lands. Uh, on which Melbourne is located, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to them. Um, in terms of the local time project, uh, it's a it's a collaboration between my uh, my partner and I, uh, Dr. Sana Ostermeyer, um, and she is a researcher at the Centre of Mental Health, uh, uh, which is a part of the University of Melbourne. Um, and its background is uh, we started out of a frustration, really. Um, when Sana moved to uh, Australia from the Netherlands, she was very frustrated at how young people were being treated in, uh, in custody um, and also how were, that, that situation was being represented in the media. Um, and so from that point, we, we began, uh, I suppose, uh, an attempt to, uh, I guess, elucidate how how a design would best support, uh, if we think of what the evidence shows is the best practice for treatment uh, of, uh, for, for young people in custody mm -hmm. in terms of behavioral uh, issues. Uh, if we look at that evidence, what would be the design implications for a facility? Um, and to ask the question, if we were starting, starting from scratch, um, Based on that evidence, what would a facility look like? Uh, so in a nutshell, that's the project. Um, we try and understand or 
have an appreciation of what best practice in terms of treatment is, and then correlate that to what the, the implication is in terms of the design of the facility. Um, and that's, that's, that's kind of it okay. from that point on. We've, we've, uh, we've won a, a design award and we've traveled to try and build the, the hypothesis and our understanding of these principles um, in uh, Norway, in Spain and the Netherlands. Um, along with visiting a number of institutions in Australia and Victoria. Mm -hmm. Does okay, that so kind of give you a bit of a background? Of absolutely, that? yes. B by the way, the project, the, the, you, you won this award in 2018, right? So this is the, yes, the, starting, the start point of the project, right? Okay. So yeah. from, this, from this experience, uh, from this experience uh, and uh, moving right into the main question of our session, as an architect and having this approach to detention facilities, do you think space can actually trigger reintegration? And if so, how? Um, it's a big question, but I, um, I, know. I think, <laughs> I think uh, that we have to kind of have a good appreciation or an understanding of what, uh, what space can actually do, what environments can do. And I think the answer is probably uh, no with a but. Um, I don't think necessarily that space or environments can trigger reintegration, but they can certainly have a profound effect on the work that goes into reintegration in that they affect the relationships, that space, spaces and environments affects the relationship between uh, staff and incarcerated people. Um, and it affects the relationships of those, um, those incarcerated people with those outside the facility as well. Um, I think uh, in, in preparation, I've kind of, uh, I've got five kind of points or areas where I think the design or the space or the environment kind of um, really has an, has an impact on how life, uh, life is carried out inside mm -hmm. a facility and how uh, it affects those relationships between incarcerated people, staff, people outside the facility, um, and then subsequently the act of being reintegrated after being in custody. Um, so the first point would be to consider how space affects relationships inside. That's mm -hmm. primarily between staff and incarcerated people. Um, this is this is kind of uh, most pronounced in terms of an issue of uh, spatial layout. Um, so if we look at the kinds of security that are used uh, or uh, in, embedded or incorporated in to the design of the facility, as well as uh, something that we've been looking at is the provision of shared, space, shared spaces for staff and young people or incarcerated people um, and perhaps I should say that the project uh, focus, focuses specifically on young people um, and I'm not entirely 100% uh, sure that everything that we've learned can be applied to the adult populations, but uh, it may also be the case that these lessons are applicable to the adult population. Um, but uh, so the, pro uh, the provision of shared spaces for staff and incarcerated people to uh, spend time with each other and get to know each other on a personal basis. Um, but also the omission or exclusion of boundaries between spaces that uh, create hierarchies or create um, uh, visual distance or distance or separation between staff and young people. Um, and then we're also looking at how the, the actual physical security infrastructure itself can kind of uh, change the way that relationships on, uh, are developed between uh, incarcerated people and staff. Let me ask you something, sorry, <laughs> Matt. This, uh, you, you addressed the, um, the concept of relational security in your mm. guide, which is related to this, right? Yes, yeah, this, is, this would be um, what we define as, um, I think uh, relational, relational security being the security that is derived from relationships between mm -hmm. staff and incarcerated people and a knowledge of uh, a knowledge by staff of the people who are incarcerated. 
Um, so instead of having a traditional surveillance uh, spot while staff are uh, making a distant vigilance from the people in custody, so mm. uh, and, and spaces. So having a security that is, that is relational. So there is uh, emphasize the relation and promote this relation between staff and and incarcerated people, mm. and, spa and 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 space can address to this as you were saying by um, by considering shared spaces, uh, spaces where staff and people in custody will be joining and having activities together and mm. the, promoting their relational, the, their social relations. Mm. So, yeah. Well, uh, through social relations, staff understand and know the individual young, young people or incarcerated people uh, more uh, with, a, with a, a greater accuracy or a, a, mm -hmm. a closer, they'll have a closer relationship. But it also is a matter of understanding the moment to moment changes. So, um, what's happening in between two incarcerated people at a certain point in time, or okay. what is happening on a particular day or a particular morning? Mm -hmm. So, by as opposed to having a surveillance model, by spending time uh, you know, with each other as two, group, two groups of people, uh, there's a better understanding of what's happening moment by moment. Um, and there's also a better understanding of the individual peoples and what's happening in their lives, what's happening in their cases, um, which provides not only greater security, but a greater potential for staff members to play an active role in the treatment process. So what's particularly important for young people who are, you know, may never have li lived outside of home before mm -hmm. uh, is that they may not necessarily have any domestic skills. Uh, so in the facilities that we've studied, these uh, shared spaces are kitchen and dining spaces. So mm -hmm. this is where staff members can help instruct young people on how to cook, how to wash, mm -hmm. how, to, how to live in what is essentially a shared living arrangement, a share house mm -hmm. with a number of other young people or, uh, and, and staff members as well. So th that's, that's kind of where those aspects of security and the, the, the potential for reintegration skills mm -hmm. perhaps uh, arises from in terms of the design of the space. And this, this also fosters some, uh, uh, an array of uh, so, uh, important social skills, even for the reintegration uh, process. Uh, mm. when you are not only promoting these interactions and the, these this skills in this uh, at a relational level, but also mm. while you were saying, uh, like preparing, involving the, the this in incarcerated population in preparing meals or making stuff. So th this lead them to learn how to take decisions, how to, Mm. Um, how to get involved in, in this in this stuff, which usually in the in the in the in, in the in, in the traditional prison system, this doesn't happen. And, and what happens is that um, incarcerated people lose those abilities, or or at least don't don't stimulate them, and mm. and this allow this allow to to happen in a in a different way, right? Mm. Yes, potentially. Um, I suppose another way of thinking about it is you're just going off what you've uh, what you've said there is that it's also um, beyond just the practicing of domestic skills. It's it's also a practicing of uh, social relationships. Mm -hmm. um, like if if the if the so the the kind of uh, predominant mode of social relationship that is being uh, applied in such a space is one of hierarchy then that's a, that's a lost opportunity for practicing communications and social skills, which can be practiced as well with staff and in between incarcerated people or young people. Um, so another opportunity that is facilitated, facilitated through having these spaces um, as, the, as the core of a, of a unit. Okay, I say we we would have a lot to say about this. Uh, I will, mm -hmm. I'm thinking even the, the thinking about how do you preserve individuality and privacy, and at the same time fostering this uh, collective uh, mm -hmm. activity. So both 
both dimensions seem to me very important and I know mm. uh, we can address them in these kind of facilities, mm. but I, I think it's also important to move for the, uh, to, to the other point. So okay. uh, I invite you to, to move forward to the second point and, and, okay. and to, to have the possibility to, to touch them okay. all. <laughs> well, uh, okay, so in a similar way uh, that mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about how how the design of a facility and the environment can affect uh, the relationships internally. Uh, they also obviously affect relationships that are happening external or uh, outside of the facility. So uh, uh, social relationships are a key protective factor in, um, in indicating whether or not someone is likely to reoffend again. Um, and the location of a facility is key in terms of uh, either promoting or impeding uh, access uh, to, to or from family and mm -hmm. the involvement of family in treatment processes. But it also, uh, quite importantly, um, in terms of reintegration, um, the position of the facility in, inside a, a larger community or a city or a town um, can either provide a lot of opportunities for the building of autonomy and the practicing of skills or the involvement in the community more generally, whether that be with sporting teams or uh, cultural groups or faith groups or work experience or employment, or even just in terms of young people, again, uh, the continuation of their schooling, which is also a, a key uh, protective factor from uh, in terms of indicating uh, 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 a drop in recidivism. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, the location of the facility uh, is a key factor and also it's interconnection with the larger city. So how readily can uh, uh, family or um, pro-social peers, mm -hmm. pro-social other, uh, other social connections, how readily can they access the facility and provide input and uh, assist with the treatment processes. Um, and also as, uh, I mean, a, a, the, a lot of the facilities that we've looked at have a have kind of semi-open regimes at the uh, tail end, uh, are getting closer to um, release, in, release from custody. Mm -hmm. um, and the building of autonomy uh, and the building of skills for moving about the city going to employment, going to school, and just being connected with society more generally. Uh, these aspects and these opportunities are facilitated by the, posi the position of the facility and its connection to, uh, say, public transport uh, sure. or modes of transport that are generally accessible to whoever is incarcerated population. So mm -hmm. if we're looking at young people, we're looking specifically at um, modes of transport that aren't car based mm -hmm. so that's public transport maybe bicycle maybe walking but most mm -hmm. most predominantly public transport so, okay so this would be the also the importance of the of keeping the the integration in, in their community right of course yeah mm -hmm. uh, um they're both physically and um i guess conceptually main, sure. mm -hmm. maintained within Very the important. community yeah Okay, so, um, so point three. Yes, so we, 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 the, yes, no, no, no. I, I can, uh, yeah, as we move forward, I would just say okay. so. The, the first two points were like relationships inside the facilities, and, and the second point, external relationships outside the facilities, right? Yeah, okay, perfect. So the first point. Uh, third point is environments can affect mental and physical health. Uh, and these, I mean, we'll keep trying to keep this one short and simple because it's, okay. it's reasonably straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, if an environment is causing the exacerbation of mental or health uh, issues or the symptoms of, that makes it incredibly difficult to address any behavioral issues or to have an effective treatment regime. Um, and in the worst case scenario, uh, you know, <laughs> the environment can have uh, have lasting impacts on somebody's mental health. In, you know, if, if we consider the the implications of uh, perhaps perhaps this is not an issue in Portugal, but uh, we have some uh, reasonably sad 
cases in which uh, young people are being uh, locked in isolation for you know, up to 23 hours a day uh, for extended periods of time. And this kind of isolation has long lasting mental health issues associated with it. Uh, so in that sense, the, the, the environment has a, a, a substantial impact on the potential for reintegration afterwards. Um, very serious. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, let me just point out here uh, something else it's just we, we were talking in the first point you were talking about the, the the importance of the relationship between staff and incarcerated people and this mm -hmm. this topic of mental health which seems uh, crucial in the in this topic but it's also this environment is it will also be uh, influential and important also to the staff Right, so uh, this can promote the well-being of the staff, which will also be determinant in this process. Right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, this is this is something that we try and focus on um, quite a bit in the design guide. Is that any improvement that you make for the incarcerated people is also an improvement that you're making for the staff members, um, and that, that that's that is so in the case of the environmental qualities themselves, but in terms of the changes that we're making or the changes that we're proposing, which improve the relationships between uh, incarcerated people and staff members, that also makes their job more satisfying. Like they, they're actually having a greater chance to uh, you know, provide support and uh, to provide an opportunity for change for the people who, are, who they work with. Um, and better, also, contribute, so. also, sorry, and better yeah. contribute, sorry. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that on top of reducing the environmental stresses, which are you know, like uh, absence of natural light, uh, um, incredible reverberation, um, lack of acoustic attenuation, that mm -hmm. is you know, uh, the proliferate, proliferation of loud sounds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, and I'm thinking of uh, the provision of green space is also an important uh, characteristic. Of a... We will have um, right away the, the opportunity to to show one example with with some images sure. which Maybe which will be useful. But but first, I, I will I will just allow you to to mention the the fourth and the and the fifth <laughs> point. So sure. we I'll get this all this whole view. Rather, yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll keep this simple as okay. Again. Yes, please. So, point four yeah. is that architecture is a language. So, an, mm. uh, a, a particular kind of facility design conveys a sense of identity to the people who both work there and who live there. Um, so, it becomes if if you have a, a facility that is designed with that uh, conveys that the people who are living inside it are dangerous people and are not to be trusted, then that will that message does go uh, come across to the people who live inside it and to the people who work inside as well. And there's an, a, another dimension to this in that from the outside, the public perception of a facility uh, is also influenced by this architectural language. If the general public sees that from the outside that this is a place where dangerous people live and they can, say, they can see that via the razor wire and rows of walls and cameras, then that is a perception that will be carried or a stigma which will be carried by the people who are incarcerated there once they've left that institution. So uh, the way that the architecture conveys senses of identity uh, is another aspect in which uh, that has as, uh, an, an effect on reintegration. Um, any thoughts or should I skip to Oh, absolutely, five? yes. It, it, I, well, I, I, I find this quite relevant, but I believe you were very clear on this. And so it's a, it's a major point uh, on this assumption. Yeah. Let's move uh, forward. <laughs> last point okay. um, is, is that um, the design of a facility is, is, a, is, a, is also a political act. Um, all, all buildings are political, regardless of, of type or place, all buildings are political. Um, but Facilities are also expensive and long lasting. Um, so, and they're a very real and tangible manifestation of a particular kind of philosophy. So if, in, if we're talking about uh, the design of incarceration spaces, 
then they are the manifestation of a particular philosophy um, or politic of a set of ideas about incarceration. So to design a facility that is centered uh, wholly around the idea of reintegration um, is, is an act which is, is a, a, it's a commitment by a government or by a people that, that, that reintegration is the crucial thing that we want our justice system to be providing or our custodial system to be uh, facilitating. Um, and there's kind of another aspect to that in which a particular kinds of architectural models uh, are, are in certain ways related to um, different uh, systems at a, at a broader level in that if we're building large scale, highly specialized, very expensive facilities, then that creates a certain kind of justice system. And because they're long lived, they have a long, uh, a long life of, a, of, of effect. Whereas uh, it's our opinion that uh, small, less specialized, more community integrated facilities are more flexible um, and that they then therefore lend themselves to uh, a justice system that is more uh, agile and able to uh, where funding is more readily able to be directed into community interventions. Uh, so in that sense, the design and building of facilities is, is, um, is a political act. Absolutely, yes. So Matt, um, I believe it could be, it could help us to focus on an example uh, to make it sure. more clear. In your evidence-based research, you looked upon precedent examples of detention facilities in different countries, as you already said. And we agreed on taking um, the example of a small scale detention house in the Netherlands, uh, mm -hmm. from which you provided us uh, some images, which I thank you. There they are. So I will ask you to guide us along these pictures. Uh, I believe we have three pictures and give us some quick idea on how can space design address to these different aspects you are, you've been pointing out through this example. Um, sure, okay. Okay. Uh, well, I, I suppose the first, first uh, trick is to point out which, where, the, where the detention house is in the photo. This is in uh, a, a neighborhood in Amsterdam. Um, and the facility itself is a small scale community integrated facility for young people. I think it's um, 12 to 18, I should check that to be sure, 12 to 18 year olds um, and uh, who have committed either a first or second offense and they're on remand, I think, I believe, though I would have to check the design guide to be absolutely sure of that. Yeah. Um, uh, but the facility itself, if you look in the image, is the it has a, a curved roof and an orange kind of form, uh, kind of sitting out above a, a brick platform. Mm -hmm. um, on the right hand side of the ah, there we go, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, but it sits right right within the the existing neighbourhoods, in amongst other apartment buildings and houses. So in terms of if we're looking at one locality, um, you can't see it in the image, but around the corner is a tram stop and around the next corner is, a, is a, another tram stop, buses, uh, but also in the immediate walking distance, there is access to uh, schools and uh, shopping centers. It's, it's, it's part, of the, part of the neighborhood. Um, it's small, it's an eight bed facility. This size, the small size and the location and the proximity to other aspects of community are, are kind of interrelated. You can't have a large facility that's fully integrated into the community. Sure. Um, and this is probably also, this is probably the slide to think of it as also a political act in that um, when the facility was first open, there was a little bit of public concern in the immediate vicinity. Um, but the, the management team went to great lengths to try and uh, uh, establish lines of communication uh, with the immediate neighbors in a very genuine way to understand what their concerns were. Um, and that became a forum through which there was a, a mutual understanding and the facility became an accepted and valuable part of the community that uh, 
that was an underst understood as such by the uh, people um, who lived adjacent, even to the point where I think there was a, a story of one of the neighbors saying, um, yeah, the, these young people are better neighbors than my neighbors on the other side. So it became, it, what started out as a, as a, a, a potential issue um, through an act of community building turned into something that was valuable. Um, unless you've got some questions about the outside, maybe we'll move to the next yes, we can, image yes. and go mm -hmm. inside. Okay, please. Okay, there they are. Okay, we have the, this, the, the two images of the, of the interior. Oh, fantastic. Great. So these are two images looking uh, in opposite directions in the living room to kind of give okay. a sense of the, the central space where, kind of where, where the work happens, I suppose. Um, bedrooms are upstairs, um, but uh, this is the living space. So, and this is uh, a shared space used by both staff and young people. Um, and in terms of the therapeutic uh, design aspects, we've got soft curtains, which are sound attenuating. We have natural light on multiple sides and coming from high levels, which, uh, which has a tendency to reduce glare. Um, we have uh, windows looking out into green spaces. Um, we have uh, textural and visual variation. Um, and I suppose, what was my second point? First point was relationship between staff and young yes. people. The second point and is the relationship, point the external, external relationships. Yeah. Well, we kind of really. covered that. Yeah. And mental and physical health. Well, that's, we're, we're providing a home-like atmosphere. So home-like atmosphere is destigmatizing and typically speaking is less likely to have uh, environmental stresses. Um, so I think we can get a good impression of that with through these two photographs as well. Okay. Do you, you, you talk about the involvement of the, of the community, of the population, the, the effort to try to engage them in this uh, as the project was, be, was being run out. And I, uh, I would like to ask you, do you believe it's possible to, to involve the target population, incarcerated people? Uh, I, I believe you mentioned this on your, on your design guide, um, the possibility of involve the target population and to hear them in the design process. Uh, is that right? And I, I don't know if you, if you have something to add to it, but I, I would also like to hear you about the possibility of involving this population on the construction process of the facility. I believe being part of the hard building process is probably too ambitious, but <laughs> mostly in final stages work and looking to these pictures, final, final works like painting, lighting, even furniture work or decoration, it's definitely possible. What's your idea about the potential impact of this participation? Um, well, firstly, uh... In terms of understanding or understanding how the lived experience of these spaces is, uh, is has an has an effect on people, um, that's that's something that's very important and that uh, not enough attention is paid to. Um, and I think that's something that we would really love to develop as we develop uh, develop the project further. Um, and in terms of the construction or the actual building process, this is something that we uh, we saw so when we visited uh, the diagrama facilities in Spain, um, as part of the vocational education, uh, as in uh, skills uh, and training of the young people. Um, these are secure schools and they are, uh, uh, they are the, the equivalent, I suppose, to uh, youth custodial facilities, but mm -hmm. they are given the provision of timber and metalworking workshops and, um, as part of the, the, the uh, I guess, skill building for these young people in their, in their, class, in their classes. They're also, they build furniture, which is used in the facility. They'll, they'll, they'll um, build themselves a chair. They'll build a table uh, that they'll be sitting around with uh, their other housemates and with the staff. 
Um, and I was very taken aback at how much there was a sense of ownership or a sense of uh, pride that was kind of in, um, built into, into the fa very fabric of these facilities. I think the gardens especially, um, uh, also on another part is uh, the lessons in horticulture, mm -hmm. but also in terms, of, uh, in terms of designing and building gardens, uh, the gardens in these facilities are amazing and they are designed and built and maintained by the young people there. And there's an enormous sense of pride. Um, I think that is, it, it's a, a wonderful idea. And I think that it's, it has enormous potential. I mean, totally not to agree. mention that it, yes. you know, it builds a, it's a, a wonderful set of skills that you can then leave uh, your time in custody with. Sure. And thank you for these images. I, I believe they have an impact on themselves for being so far from the idea we have of, uh, of detention facilities. And we brought this example, but there are many. Uh, some of them you have, you have it in your research and some of them very close to it. So this is not an isolated case even though there's still very few con considering the whole incarceration population, but it shows us that it's possible to, to have restorative buildings uh, rather than punitive ones, right? So, um, mm -hmm. Regarding this specific, um, these specific facilities in the Netherlands, uh, there are some outcomes that have been measured upon these local facilities and specifically in this facility too, with very positive results regarding the relations of young people with their parents during and after the custody, um, as the continuity of their activities uh, in school or work or taking health care. How far do you think we can go on trying to establish causality relations between specific aspects of space design and behavior within an integration process? We, we already discussed briefly this previously, but uh, I would like to bring it here, or even if we should aspire such regarding the complexity of the phenomena, but what do you think? Mm. Um, I, I think it's very difficult to establish direct causal relationships. And I suppose this goes back to what we said at the, uh, at the very beginning, which is that it's not, the, it's not the space or the environment that actually, um, that actually contribute or triggers reintegration but it does assist um, you know, it does have an effect either positive or negative. Um, so I think there is, there's, there's plenty of scope for us to understand precisely um, what the design aspects really contribute um, in terms of either impeding or aiding the, the process of reintegration or the process of rehabilitation. Um, but I, I think it's also worth just remembering how significantly interwoven um, these aspects are. Like we're talking about the relationships between staff and incarcerated people or the relationships between the general public and incarcerated people. And there are so many cultural aspects, uh, so, many, um, so many variables that uh, occur just between people, mm -hmm. uh, which have profound effects on that. So, in order to fully understand what the design implications are, we have to be able to control for that, which is a significant, um, a significant challenge, I think. Um, and I think environmental behaviour uh, is a is a difficult field in that respect. Absolutely. Um, but I don't think that necessarily takes away from the potential value of understanding uh, mm -hmm. very clearly what the design can do. Um, and I'm sorry, I think do, I've do, the last do you section believe, of you. And anyway, do you believe it's worth to, to, to keep going with a uh, systematic observation uh, of some relations that probably can give us some light of, because there are some of these aspects that are quite, for us nowadays are quite common sense, like uh, the, sunlight or connections with external environment and mm. connection with nature and, and some of these aspects have been widely 
studied and investigated uh, with mm. their within their effect the direct their direct effects sorry <laughs> in the, mm. in behavior and issues like mental health and uh, and well-being and so forth um so do you believe it's worth it it's worth to raise new hypotheses and observe them systematically in some aspects of the of the design that pro that might have some impact on behavior regarding always regarding an integration process mm. do you believe i mean do you have some do you have some uh, hypothesis that that you envision <laughs> and that you would like to raise in the future no i suppose uh Sandra and i are working on working on a, a chapter at the moment which would be uh establishing some hypotheses um that we would like to test um in the future um, and that is, is, is kind of centered around those items that I've discussed before. Um, we're looking specifically at how a facility's size, how its location and its interconnection with uh, the broader context, mm -hmm. as well as uh, its security measures um, and uh, also the, the extent to which certain uh, therapeutic design uh, um, therapeutic environmental characteristics rather uh, are present, we would very much like to be able to explore just how effective those uh, design characteristics are in terms of the lived experience of both incarcerated people and staff. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we're, we'd be very hopeful to do in, in the future. Um, or for someone else to do in the future, it would be <laughs> sure. wonderful. <laughs> Sure. Matt, one, la one final question from my side, and then I suggest we jump for Q&A. But I, will, I would just like to ask you, by this time, how is the local time guide being received, particularly the openness that you feel from local authorities to <laughs> its recommendations, to your recommendations? Um, I would say it's been mostly positive, I think. Yeah. Um, there, there's definitely, I mean, the def uh, We've, it, I suppose the design guide was written specifically for the context of Victoria. Mm -hmm. uh, and the higher up the political chain we have traveled, uh, the more hesitant it has been, hesitantly it has been received. Um, but I think in terms of uh, the public service who are very familiar with uh, the justice system and the issues that it faces, um, as well as uh, academics and people who have worked in the justice system as well. Um, I've been actually quite surprised at how well it's been received. Um, and I think that probably uh, to speak of the context, it, um, Victoria has recently had a, a, you know, a large scale review into uh, its youth justice system, mm -hmm. including its youth justice facilities. So I think there's quite an appetite for um, some more, you know, more substantial thinking and changing of uh, of the system, um, because there's an there's a there's a, a latent understanding that things need to change. So um, these are good news. We hope. Uh, well, yeah, we'll try. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you, Matt. I believe so. This is the right moment to take some questions from our audience. So. Thank you for all you've shared with us so far. And so I will take the first question. So how is security and surveillance guaranteed in these spaces open to the community that you have showed? Is there any kind of surveillance of prisoners, like electronic surveillance, for example? Um, so if we use the example of the Dutch, the Amsterdam facility rather, mm -hmm. um, there are CCTV cameras um, in certain locations and at certain points outside, but it's not by far and away not the predominant mode of surveillance. The, the, most, the primary and most significant mode of surveillance is that young people spend their, the time in the facility with the staff member. So mm -hmm. the fact that it is a small facility, it's, it has eight beds um, and that staff members are uh, there, I think, um, Around the clock, yes, but uh, there are more staff members present um, at the points of the day where the young people are uh, 
you know, rising from bed and getting ready to go to school or, mm -hmm. um, or uh, in the evening when they're preparing meals. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the surveillance of the, the, is, the surveillance within the facility is on a personal level, primarily. Okay, so another question. In the places you visited and also in your opinion, to what extent should individuality be respected in terms of decoration? Should these places be decorated in a modest and standardized way? And what about the, ex the, the extent of privacy? Individual bedrooms, what about toilets and showers? So we, we mentioned this, but we, we didn't elaborate on this. So this is an opportunity to go further. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, individual bedrooms uh, across the board um, and uh, then there's a different there's a there's a, a kind of a, a range of relationships in terms of having uh, bathrooms uh, or the arrangement of bathrooms in Norway for instance uh, each room had a its own ensuite um, the Amsterdam facility had a, a toilet in the room but um, shower shower and bath facilities were shared um, and in the Spanish facilities, uh, both the toilets and the showers and uh, bathing facilities were all shared, uh, but uh, private bedrooms, of course. Um, in terms of the uh, individuality of the space, um, I just think of all, all of the facilities we've studied have been personalized. Um, okay. Bedrooms have all been personalized with personal belongings um, on the walls, on the shelves. Um, I can re remember that there seemed to be uh, a, quite, quite a focus on that in, mm -hmm. um, in Spanish facilities, uh, especially because of that uh, element in which the, the, the physical uh, uh, the furniture as well is, um, is part of the uh, is made as part of the uh, of the, of the building. building. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's kind of a, another level on top of the mm -hmm. uh, personalization of space. Um, yeah, we've got personal objects on the walls. Um, I I don't know if I can I can give a an overall rule uh, or um, observation off the top of my head in that respect because there seem to be different. Um, approaches to that. All of the all the spaces were personalized, and there was an ability to personalize them. But in I'm um, sorry, I'm thinking of the communal spaces now. Uh, I think there seem to be different approaches to that, and I would hesitate to guess that they they were uh, affected by the different cultural, uh, uh, like in terms of the different uh, cultural practices in a broader sense. Um, I think. The, okay, not the, not cultural back individual individual cultural background, but the cultural well, in terms context. Of, yeah, the, mm -hmm. I think the prevailing idea has been we would like you know the the intention is that these are home like spaces. So how does a how does a particular pop, you know, culture uh, make a space feel home like? Mm -hmm. Some uh, some are going, and this is also down to the individual people living in the space at the time and the individual staff members as well. Um, but I think there's a, there's a, 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 a variation in the way that that is achieved, mm -hmm. um, but there is personalization, um, and that I think is important. Sure. So let's move to another question. What do you think about colors in the prison facilities, and should there be walls left for prisoners' art? Um, uh, I think if we follow the example of the of the the Spanish facilities, then that could potentially be very useful or uh, um, very intriguing. Um, I haven't seen that. I don't think in any of the facilities we've looked at, but I can't immediately see any issues with it. Um, I think it would probably come down to the way that it's carried out. Like, is it um, is the process that is undertaken to paint the walls something that builds community within the facility, builds a sense of ownership, builds a sense of pride? Um, uh, does it help build uh, relationships between staff and people who are incarcerated? Um, I think 
uh, if if it does those things, then there's no reason that uh, a wall shouldn't be painted. And in terms of color, um, I'm a little bit. Uh, color is important. Color is variation in color is a a uh, a therapeutic environmental quality. But I'm also a little bit hesitant to talk about color because um, color is something that uh, I feel architects seem to have they have a little bit of agency over. Um, so in terms of like architects, when they delivered a brief for a project, they, they're probably not going to be able to choose where or how big um, or necessarily the spatial arrangements in such detailed briefs as the ones we're talking about, but they probably will be able to choose the color. Um, and so I feel like this little bit, there's, a, there's often a little bit of a, um, perhaps there's a little bit too much weight or uh responsibility put on the color of the walls, if that makes sense. Um, variation is important, but I'm not entirely sure that uh, there is any particular set of colors which is going to uh, help reintegration. By the way, talking about variation, not only uh, color variation, but the, all the space variation is, is important in the, in the, uh, in the cognitive mm. experience of the, yeah. of the interior of the building, right? That's correct, spatial and textural and uh, color as well. Uh, okay. So just uh, sensual variation uh, is important. Okay. So another question, can you give examples of configurations of space in a traditional prison that may severely, severely and negatively affect mental health and must be avoided? I believe there are plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Where to start? Um, uh, but my my pet my pet one is um, hard surfaces with reflected sound. Um, this is my personal uh, my personal mm -hmm. most uh, strongly uh, strongly avoided uh, not to do environmental condition. Yeah, not to do. Um, but to keep it to keep it keep it evidence based. Um, Oh, so I, I just I feel like if if, there, if sound is constant and clattering and uh, distracting, that leaves you no space for uh, calm. That leaves you no space for thinking, no space for learning. Uh, it raises stress levels, which has all sorts of associated uh, health effects. Also, so I think sound is just is just atrocious. The, 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 in some of the facilities that I've seen. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, spatial layout, I, un mm -hmm. I know that there is a, a study that has been done of thirty two different facilities across the Netherlands, which has related the spatial layout to um, the prisoners' perception of their relationships with staff members. So, in that sense, uh, from memory, I think it was a panopticon layout which had the most negative um mm -hmm. effect and i think that that that, that that's um that aligns with this understanding that uh any 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 layout or uh set of spatial arrangements which promotes deliberately promotes distance between staff members and uh incarcerated people mm -hmm. um, is going to have the desired effect it is going to distance staff and Sure, uh, and incarcerated people with an, so with that's a couple with of, a severe negative effect in the re in the integration process for sure. Well, uh, at least lost opportunities, yeah. um, and at worst, the creation of a dangerous environment. Mm -hmm. So another question: What is your insight about general population being against the chance that some prisons might have more conditions than their own homes? Hmm. Um, my, my response is that, uh, well, the, the philosophy is that the loss of, um, the loss of liberty is punishment. Um, and I would suggest that people that have that perception have probably not given a really close thought as to how difficult it is to go through the day without being able to determine anything for yourself. Um, I suppose uh, in the sense that there are amenities provided 
um, that may not necessarily be accessible to everybody? That's a hard question because um, that this is, you know, we're talking about the standard of housing across a, a population. Um, and should, uh, should a, a custodial facility have a better standard of housing than the general population? I'm not sure that that's, that's um, necessarily desirable. What we definitely don't want is the standard of housing in, in CUSS in, in, in a facility to be any worse than the general standing standard of housing. The intention is that it is a home-like space, that it is non-stigmatizing, um, and that it is it is it provides a space to practice be uh, pro-social behaviors. Um, so I suppose the, that that's the intention, if that if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. But the other aspect is um, when you spend time inside these facilities. Um, even though they are, they look like a home, um, they still very much feel like a facility. You're quite aware of the fact that you are not in a home. It's that you are incarcerated. You're, you're very aware that you're incarcerated. Sure. Um, and the, I mean, the, the characteristics of the space are there to do, to not do damage. Essentially, they are there to prevent stigmatization, and they're there to prevent uh, the conveyance of an identity that you are a prisoner or a criminal. Um, and to, they, the intention is that they provide a a, uh, a reasonable standard of living that would be expected outside of the facility as well. So Matt, one final question. Um, given that governments are not going to reinvest in a completely new architecture for this system, what kind of low cost, quick win would you suggest to achieve the biggest impact possible? Mm. <laughs> That's a question. It's not easy to, <laughs> yes, to give a <laughs> short answer to this, but if you can address some reflection to it. Um, first point is that these, uh, a new model does not necessarily have to be um, expensive or it's definitely not going to be as expensive on the same magnitude of, as what we're used to for prison spending. So these are a, a small scale community integrated facility, like for instance, the one in Amsterdam is a retrofit of an existing government building, uh, of an existing social housing. Um, so, and the retrofits are reasonably minor as well. Um, so we're talking about these are the amount of money that would have to be spent to, pro to provide a small scale community integrated facility uh, is, is orders of magnitude less than what we're used to spending on custody. Um, but if, if we're talking, uh, I mean, I think that in the, if we look to New York City, for instance, they also have a small scale uh, community integrated facilities that are retrofitted uh, homes. They're normal brownstone uh, terrace buildings that have just been retrofitted again uh, in a similar way so that they are suitable for uh, young, young people to be incarcerated. Um, so the capital costs are small. Um, and the, the, the length of time that uh, is required to create these facilities is, is short. Um, the real impediment is not so much financial as it is cultural um, and it is as it is political. Um, the and you, and you, address, you address, sorry, Ian, you address to a cost benefit analysis in your guide that we won't have the time to, <laughs> to, to address to it. So. At a high level, yes. yes. Um, but very interesting, um, but very interesting reflection and very important. So Matt, we will now have to close our session. It was a great pleasure and a privilege for me to have this conversation with you, Matt. Oh, so likewise. thank you for, for sharing your knowledge and your thoughts with us. I believe with this conversation helped us to better understand the importance of living in a space where no one is just a prisoner or an offender, but someone who preserves his her own 
identity, with agency, with autonomy, with the opportunity to take decisions and healthy social interactions. And this can certainly trigger change, I believe. So thank you once again. We will we, we, we wish all the best achievements to local time project and its purposes. Thank so you. thank you. I also want to address special thanks to Instituto Miguel Galvão de Alge and the five partners that made this event possible, Delta, Rescaled Movement, Active Citizens Fund, Reshape Ceramics and ECHO. And I'll give a final thank to APAC for this initiative and to all the team that supported us on this session. After the end of the session, everyone who attended it will be automatically forwarded to a, to a brief evaluation survey that we kindly ask you to answer in order to help us improve this event. So here we end our session. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you.